Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Amateur Radio General Class, session number 11. During our previous class, we had a question pool review of the questions related to the slide deck from the previous class. We looked at the following topics, modulation, amplitude modulation. We discussed what the modulation envelope was. We also looked at single sideband, the concept of over modulation. We also looked at other modes such as frequency modulation, phase modulation. We also contemplated what was FSK or frequency shift keying and its use in RITI or RTTY. We also looked at phase shift keying or PSK and we looked relatedly to the QPSK31 as well as FT8 and we ended with a look at the WSJTX software that is used for FT8 and other similar modes. In terms of our curriculum, we are still on this topic, signals and emissions. Today we should be close to completing, we will not finish this topic today, but just about uh, almost complete. Reminder to consider taking pra the practice exams. Okay, so we had one question from the last class. And the question was, do you have the textbook for sale? So no, unfortunately not. However, participants may purchase the textbook directly via the online merchant Amazon.com using the following URL. So it's up on your screen. You don't have to take it down now. It will be circulated in the slide deck. And then the email that is sent out to participants will make sure that we uh, put it in. As a matter of fact, I think this week's uh, session, we would have included it as well for that purpose. All right. So, right. So let's get straight into the question pool review for the questions related to the theory of the classes of the uh, slides from last class. All right. So, as we have been accustomed to, we will quickly go through the slides, uh, the questions in relation to uh, the last class. All right. So the first question that we'll deal with would be, what type of modulation varies the instantaneous power level of the RF signal? So let's dissect that question. They're asking us what type of modulation. And the modulation schemes that we learned were EM, FM, PM, right? So it's going to be one of those. And we're looking for the modulation that varies the instantaneous power levels of the RF signal. In other words, it varies the amplitude. Once we see power levels here, it's the amplitude. And we know from last class that is AM amplitude modulation. Related question. What is the modulation envelope of an AM signal? So last class we had a diagram up and we showed what the modulation envelope looked like and we described how to get it and that's the answer. It's the waveform created by connecting the peak values of the modulated signals. Signal. Moving right along. Which of the following phone emissions uses the nar narrowest bandwidth? So let's dissect this question a little bit. They're asking us which phone emission. So remember when we said phone in amateur radio, when we talk about phone, you could think of it as speech or voice or talking. So we are looking for a phone emission as opposed to let's say, a digital signal or something else, a phone emission. And we are looking for one that uses the narrowest bandwidth. And the reason they specify phone emission is because we learned that one of the emissions that 
uses the narrowest bandwidth is CW, but they're not asking us about that type of mode. They're asking us about phone emission. So therefore, it's, the answer is not going to be CW, it'll be something else. And they want us to answer the question, the one that uses the narrowest bandwidth. And we had a diagram on the last slide deck that showed the various bandwidths for CW, SSB, AM, FM. And we saw that single sideband or SSB use the lowest amount of bandwidth. Next question in the question pool. What is meant by the term flat topping when referring to a single sideband phone transmission? So let's dissect this question a little bit. They're asking us about flat topping. So we need to talk about what flat topping is. What is it defined as? Or how do we know what flat topping is? Or when we use the term, what do we mean by it? But of course, they give us the extra information that we are dealing with SSB, phone or voice transmissions. And we had said that flat topping is a distortion or signal distortion caused by excessive drive. You either speak in too loudly or you have your AF or some setting on your radio too high and it is driving that signal too much and it causes distortion. Next question, which of the following is an effective is an effect of overmodulation? So let's dissect this question. They're asking us for an effect, right? Or an observation, or how will we know when we are overmodulation? How can you tell um, or what happens when someone is overmodulating? What is an effect or what is a result of overmodulation? As we learned in the last class, when you overmodulate, you may use excessive bandwidth, which is a bad thing. Moving right along, what is the name of the process that changes the instantaneous frequency of an RF wave to convey information? Okay, let's dissect this one. They say, what is the name of the process? Now, they could have really asked, you know, what mode? But they say, what is the name of the process that changes the instantaneous frequency? So it's not the amplitude or the power level that is changing. It's the frequency of the RF wave that is changing to convey information. So remember, we dealt with AM, which is change in amplitude or power levels. We dealt with phase modulation. And we dealt with the one where the frequency changes. And that is FM or frequency modulation. Next question in the question pool. What is the name of the process that changes the phase angle of an RF signal to convey information? So very similar to the previous question, but let's dissect it and see what the difference is. They're asking us, what is the name of the process? Again, they could have easily asked us the mode. What mode? What is it changing? Is it changing the amplitude? Is it changing the frequency? No, it's changing the phase angle. So because it's a phase angle that is changing, that should give us a clue as to what the answer is going to be. So it's changing the phase angle of the RF signal to convey the information. So we are modulating because we are putting information onto the RF or the radio frequency signal, but we are modulating the phase angle and therefore it's phase modulation. Next question related. What emission is produced by a reactance modulator connected to a transmitter RF amplifier stage? So remember we did some slides that showed what are the various components of receivers and transmitters. We showed you the different sections of the uh, diagrams. And we learned that a reactance modulator produces phase modulation, okay? Moving right along. Next question in the question pool. How is an FSK signal generated? So let's dissect this question a little bit. FSK, frequency shift keying. So notice sometimes in the question, they will abbreviate and not give you the full meaning. So you're not phased by that because you know FSK is frequency shift keying. But they want to know how it's generated. 
So remember we said that for frequency shift keying, we use a digital signal to control the oscillator's frequency? Well, that's the answer. An FSK signal is generated by changing an oscillator's frequency directly with a digital control signal. That's how an FSK signal is produced. Next question in the question pool. They're asking us, which of the following is characteristic of QPSK31? So what they're asking us for this mode, QPSK31, what are the characteristics or what are the properties of it? And one of the slides we did discuss what are the properties of QPSK31, and they're asking us for just that, the characteristics. So all of these three are on your slide deck and they are all correct. Q for QPSK31, it is sideband sensitive. Its encoding provides error correction. And its bandwidth is approximately the same as BPSK31. So if you need a refresher on this, just have a look at this slide in the slide deck or you can watch last week's video. Okay, next question in the question pool. What type of modulation is used by the FT8 digital mode? So remember we discussed FT8 last class and we said it's a digital mode. We learned that it uses eight tone frequency shift keying. So it's an FSK type modulation but it uses 8-tone. If you want to learn how to remember it, FT8. So the 8 there means 8 tones. So fairly straightforward. Sometimes the answer is in the question. All right. Which of the following narrow band digital modes can receive signals with very low signal to noise ratios? Let's dissect this question a little bit. What are they asking us? They're asking about a mode. So not just any mode, they're asking us about a digital mode. So we learned about a couple of digital modes, but we learned last class about FT8. So that might very well be the answer. But what about the digital mode that we want to match the question? Which digital mode do we need to answer? And they have given us some further information here. You can receive signals with very low signal to noise ratios. So last class, we would have mentioned that the FT8 is a weak signal propagation mode. It works very well when the signal level to the noise level is very low. What that means, it's weak. When your signal to noise is very low, that means you have a relatively weak signal. When your signal to noise ratio is high, meaning you have big signal compared to the noise, it's a big powerful signal, it drowns out the noise. But when you have a low signal to noise ratio, sometimes that signal is hardly discernible from the noise. You're listening, you're hardly hearing anything, it's there. But FT8 is a mode that can still get through when the noise is high and the signal level is low in comparison. And that's the answer, FT8. So let's now go back to our trusty slide deck. All right, so we're back to our slide deck and we have just completed our question pool review from our last session. And we will now proceed into the theory for this evening's class. So yes, indeed, welcome everyone. Very excellent attendance this evening. All right, so let's go. This term that we have in the title for the slide should not be entirely unfamiliar. It should not be very strange to us. Heterodyning simply means mixing. So you know, we have to find fancy terms to describe sometimes simple things. So we say heterodyning, but it's really mixing. You know, some of us who may be uh, you know, friends of the bar, we want to have a drink, we mix a cocktail or something like that. Not always alcoholic, but you know, we mix 
So we heterodyning, we mixing two things, right? So think of heterodyning as going to the bar. We're going to mix something. So we say heterodyning is the mixing of two radio frequency signals. That is what we are mixing. When you go to the bar, we're mixing maybe alcoholic, non-alcoholic drinks. But heterodyning, we do, we're doing amateur radio, and therefore it's radio frequency signals that we are mixing. And we say here that a mixer takes two input signals. So that's what we're mixing. So just like in the bar, you may have a chaser, and you will have your you know, main drink. So you're mixing two inputs, except that for amateur radio, it's two radio frequency signals. The mixer processes them, and it produces output. But for the mixer, when we are talking heterodyning, there are two output signals that are produced. So if we were to look on the uh, bottom right-hand uh, corner of the diagram here, we will see we have input signal, we have a local oscillator, and then we have the mixer that mixes them, and then we have an output. We are saying, however, that the output would be two different signals. The first one will be the addition or the sum of the two inputs, and the second one will be the difference, so you're minusing the two inputs to get the output. So there are two outputs. One is called the sum, and one is called the difference. So in the case of a super heterodyne receiver, you have the RF input frequency, that is the signal that you want to receive. So I'm an amateur radio operator, and I want to listen to my good friend Franz in St. Lucia. He's transmitting, and he's transmitting all the way across the waters, and we are listening to his transmission. It's coming into my receiver, and that is the input radio frequency signal. When it gets into my receiver section, a mixer takes his signal, it amplifies it, goes to the mixer, and then there's a local oscillator that generates a frequency, and the mixer in my receiver mixes Franz's signal coming into my radio with the local frequency that's generated, and it produces an output. So it combines or it mixes the radio frequency from the antenna being received with a local oscillator frequency that is generating a signal also. It mixes it. The signal that is produced is known as the IF or intermediate frequency. That's why we say it's the IF output. It's not if, it's not the word if, it's IF, intermediate frequency. Just a little note here, you can have different IF stages. Some of you who are a little more advanced will say, well, you know, you can have a first IF and a second IF. You'll be correct. But we are keeping it simple. We're just saying that you have an intermediate frequency that is produced. We need to know that the IF, that intermediate frequency, always ends up as the same frequency. So once you have a radio, that IF doesn't change. So your input frequency into the radio will change. So you may tune to 14.240, you may change the frequency to 14.074. And that's the frequency. But the IF is always going to be the same, whatever that output is. Let's say it's 455 kilohertz. Uh, that always is 455. What changes, apart from your input frequency, your local oscillator changes that frequency so that the mixer, when it mixes it, always output the same frequency. So that's a property of a mixer, and there are reasons for that. Basically, we're breaking down that frequency. Said Franz is transmitting from St. Lucia to Trinidad and Tobago, and we're breaking it down to a lower frequency so that this, the other stages in our receiver can process it. So we're breaking down the frequency using that mixer. So we call that tuning the frequency. When we tune the radio, we are tuning really the local oscillator to mix with the input frequency so we can end up with the same IF output. Let's say 455 kilohertz. When the radio is tuned to receive a signal, the local oscillator outputs a different frequency. So when you're tuning your radio, it's really the local oscillator that you are tuning so that it matches the input frequency in such a way that the output frequency is the same, no matter what your input frequency is. That ensures that the same IF frequency results in the output. So let's give an example of what we just talked about here. So on the right-hand side, we have a diagram. It shows our mixer. It shows the frequency that we are receiving. So Franz is transmitting from St. Lucia. So he's coming in at 14.250 megahertz. 
and I want to end up with 455 kilohertz. So I mix a frequency inside of there and I mix 13.795. I will show you shortly how we get 13.795. I tune my oscillator so that it generates that frequency. So when it mixes with Franz's signal 14.250, I get an output of 455 kilohertz. Now notice that we have some little formula here. We have frequency one, frequency two, the mixer takes it and outputs two frequencies. Remember we said it does the sum and the difference. We have frequency one plus frequency two, then frequency one minus frequency two. But we have discarded the sum and we are only interested in the difference, the frequencies when they minus. And when we minus these two frequencies, they get 0.455 megahertz or 455 kilohertz. This is what we want to make sure we get. So let's say the frequency you want to receive is 14 decimal 250C. That's what Franz is transmitting. He is using his EHF transceiver and he is transmitting a phone or a voice signal on that frequency on upper sideband going through his antenna, uh, coming to us in Trinidad and Tobago and we're receiving it. But my receiver's intermediate frequency is 455 kilohertz. Remember, that's a set frequency that doesn't change. My IF needs to be 455. So therefore, my local oscillator gets tuned and generates a signal on the frequency such that Franz's signal can end up as 455 kilohertz because that's my IF frequency. So the oscillator determines what that frequency is to be that it generates and we can calculate it. So Franz is coming in at 14 decimal 250. We need to end up with 455 kilohertz and therefore when we subtract it we get 13795 megahertz. That's how we end up with 13795 that the oscillator needs to output to the mixer so that the output from the mixer can be 455 kilohertz. You'll say, but wait a minute, if there's another station, uh, let's say in Puerto Rico, that is transmitting on 14 decimal 240, I still have to end up with a 455 kilohertz IF signal. What does the mixer have to get as an input from the local oscillator, this frequency here, F2? Well, because 214, 240 is just 10 kilohertz lower, all I need to do is adjust my local oscillator to 10 kilohertz less. So I end up with 13785 instead of 13795. Because my receive frequency is uh, 10 kilohertz lower, instead of 14 decimal 250, I'm tuning in now 14 decimal 240. That's 10 less. Then I use my oscillator and generate a frequency that is 10 less. Instead of 13795, I go to 13785. And when I put that 13785 in here to receive 14 decimal 240, I still end up with 455 on the output. And that is how a mixer works. We discard the sum and we keep the uh, minus or the subtraction or the difference. So another concept that as amateur radio operators we need to be familiar with. So remember, this is why we learn all of these things so that we can optimize and operate properly. We need to be aware of something called image response. So it's in relation to our discussion, our mixer. We can have problems with our mixer. There's a problem with simple super heterodyne or super head receivers and that is called image response. But what is image response and why is it a problem? Well, remember we said that the output from the mixer, so this is our trusty mixer here, we have the frequency that we're trying to listen to, and we have the frequency generated by the lo local oscillator here. And when it mixes, it outputs the sum and the difference. That's the problem. It outputs these two. So that is a bit of an issue for us, right? We want to output only 455. That is our IF stage. That is what we're interested in decoding later on in the different stages of our receiver. We don't want the summation at all. So we say that the output from the mixer contains both the sum, that is the plus of the two frequencies, and the difference or the minus of the two input frequencies. And therefore, uh, it can entirely output two different frequencies, right? So what we have to do now is let's give an example of what we mean. 
because these two frequencies that can be outputted, um, we have to be aware that two entirely different frequencies can also produce the same IF. Because we are doing summation and we are doing subtraction, we could have that situation. So let's give an example to illustrate the problem. If we have a receiver and it doesn't have good filtering on the input, you can have a, frequent, a signal that's both on, let's say, 14.255, that's the desired frequency, 14.255, that's what we're interested in receiving. That's, let's say, the frequency that Franz has chosen to talk to us on, and we want to receive him on 14.255. But because of how the mixer works, another frequency, 13.345, which is not what we're interested in, that's why you call that the unwanted frequency, it can mix inside of the local oscillator with the same frequency that is generated by the local oscillator. That mixer could mix the 13.8 megahertz frequency with both the desired, which is 14.255, as well as the undesired, which is 13.345, and end up producing 455 kilohertz, which is our IF. Let's show how that is done. So we have our desired frequency here, 14.255. Franz is talking to us on that, and that is perfectly fine. If we have uh, that frequency and we do a subtraction, 14.255, and the local oscillator is generating 13.800. If we subtract uh, the two, 14.255 minus 13.800, we will end up with the correct 455. You can check that for yourself. Use your trusty calculator, subtract these two figures, and convince yourself that you end up with 455. That is what we're aiming for. But the unwanted frequency, 13.345, if we take 13.800, which is the local oscillator frequency, and we subtract 13.345, guess what we will end up with? Convince yourself, use a calculator. We will also end up with 455. So that is a problem for us. The unwanted frequency mixing and subtracting with the local oscillator will also give us 455. So we will listen to friends, we will hear him, but guess what? We will have a problem and we will also hear a signal if there is any on 13.345, which is an unwanted signal. So that is why image response, that feature where you have those unwanted signals also mixing, potentially generating the same IF output, that is called image response. That behavior is called image response. It can lead to us hearing signals on both frequencies simultaneously, the wanted frequency and the unwanted frequency because how the mixer works by summation and subtraction. That behavior is called image response, and it is considered a type of interference. So let us take a little break, uh, get a stretch, have some water, bathroom break, and we'll come back in two minutes to continue.
Okay, everyone, welcome back. So, as we are talking about image response, uh, it's kind of like a mirage. You're looking ahead, you're seeing something on the landscape, but then you're seeing something from much further away, uh, if you have ever seen a mirage. So, you're seeing something that you, it's not in front of you really, but you're seeing it there. Uh, also, some of us may have had an experience where we are listening to a radio station, but we are hearing another radio station coming in as well. Uh, so that could be an example of um, how image a poor image response in a receiver would look or, or sound. And speaking of look, some of us rem may remember from broadcast television uh, what we used to call back then co-channel interference was the term sometimes people used to describe it. You're looking at one television station and you're seeing almost images of another uh, television station. So that, if you want, need something to conceptualize, uh, if you have a poor image response, what it is, you're listening to a signal or you're looking uh, at a signal and you're getting a signal other than the one you want, an unwanted signal because of poor filtering in the circuitry. Okay, so we come to another problem or problematic concept, and that is called intermodulation. So intermodulation, we are still talking about our trusty mixer. So on the right hand side here, we have our mixer that takes one frequency and another frequency and mix it. You get the sum and the difference. So we're still talking about our mixer. But when our mixer combines the two input signals, but let's say it is doing so in a non-linear fashion. It should do it as an, in a linear fashion, but what, are, what happens if it's not linear? It can produce random frequencies on the output. So those unwanted frequencies are considered to be spurious outputs, which we also refer to as intermod. We have a little diagram here to show, if you look at the two green lines, those are the frequencies uh, that we have and we want, but notice that we have different frequencies that are being generated as well that are unwanted. Uh, harmonic frequencies, different combinations, um, twice times one plus the other one and so on. So if they, it's not linear and you have other frequencies mixing inside of there, you will end up with a problem unwanted output, also called spurious output, or referred to as intermod or intermodulation. So again, this is an exam question also. So, speaking of problems, well, not everything is problematic. We have some very deliberate things that we do in amateur radio and one of them is in generating radio frequency signals. We use techniques where we will generate a frequency, not the frequency that we want to reach, but we generate it, and then we use another technique to increase the frequency to the one that we want. So we come to the concept of multipliers. So let us say I'm an amateur radio operator, and I want to produce an FM signal on the two meter band. So again, Perhaps we can recall from our technician class where the two meter band is for amateur radio operators. The two meter band, it's in the VHF part of the spectrum. And remember VHF is between 30 megahertz and 300 megahertz. But the amateur band that is inside of there is 144 to 148. At least that's one of the bands that's allocated to amateur radio operators. It's called the two meter VHF band, 144 to 148. So I want to produce a signal. I want to transmit a signal in that range, in the two meter VHF band, somewhere between 144 and 148 megahertz. But I may start by generating a lower frequency, let's say 12 megahertz. So I create that frequency, I use, it, I use circuitry and I generate 12 megahertz. Now notice 12 megahertz is not 144 megahertz. It's not anywhere as high as, as that frequency but I'm able to generate 12 megahertz. I can then use circuitry called multipliers. And I can use a multiplier that will multiply my frequency that I generated at 12 megahertz 
to my desired operating frequency of 144 megahertz. Now, just a quick check. Remember our 12 timetables. We might remember the 12 12 is 144. So you may say, but wait a minute, for me to go from 12 megahertz, which is what I've just generated in my radio, the stage in my radio, it's generated 12, I'm successfully generating 12, but I wanna reach 144 megahertz. You would be correct if you said, well, all I need to do is multiply that 12 times. And that's exactly what we do. We take our 12 megahertz signal that we generate in our radio, and we multiply it by 12 using a multiplier. Right, and Anthony just uh, uh, noted here that we have Prime Day on the 21st and 22nd. So persons who are looking to shop for the book, um, you could probably take advantage of that. Maybe there will be a deal. So thanks a lot there, Anthony, for that tip. So continuing, in my radio, I'm generating 12 megahertz, but I want to reach 144 megahertz, which is where I have Spectrum as a licensed amateur radio operator. So I use a multiplier that will multiply that 12 to 144 and the multiplier in this case will of course be 12 because 12 12s are 144 so we have our 12 megahertz input that we generated we pass it through the multiplier circuitry and we end up with 144 megahertz output and that is exactly what a mul multiplier does it takes the lower frequency it multiplies it and gives us the desired operating frequency and that's the function of a multiplier So, with our multiplier, when we use our multiplier, we have to be careful in doing that multiplication. There's the property of a signal, an FM signal, called deviation. Now, if I create a frequency at 12 megahertz, and I want to multiply it to go to 144 megahertz, all well and fine. But I also need to make sure the property of my signal, and if we look here on the, let's say, right-hand side, I have a particular deviation. I generate my frequency at 12 megahertz. But if I multiply the frequency by 12, I will also multiply my deviation, and therefore I might end up over-deviating. So therefore, when I generate my 12 megahertz signal that I want to reach to 144, I cannot use the same deviation when I generate my 12 megahertz, I have to reduce my deviation to a lower amount so that when it gets multiplied by the 12 multiplier, it will end up with a proper deviation. So that is exactly what these bullet points are saying here. When we use multiplier, the deviation of the original signal has to be smaller. If it's not smaller, we will over deviate. So if we are using a 12 multiplier, we have to make sure our generated signal at 12 megahertz is 1 12th. If we're using a 12 multiplier, it has to be 1 12th deviation at that level. So when the multiplier multiplies the frequency, it's not only multiplying the frequency from 12 megahertz to 144 megahertz, it's multiplying the little deviation that we have 12 times. So when we generate our lower frequency signal, we have to make sure it is 1 12th of what we want to end up with after we pass. So basically, we have our deviation here on the input. We have our frequency as well on the input. We get it multiplied 12 times. So the frequency is multiplying by 12. So we end up with a frequency. So let's say 12 megahertz multiplied by 12 gets 144 megahertz. But if we have a deviation, a small deviation, that also gets multi multiplied by 12. So therefore, we need to bear that in mind that the output is times 12 for the deviation, and therefore the input deviation we have to make sure is 1 12th of what we desire in the final output. So let's give an example, make it real. This is an actual question in the exam, but we'll hope, hopefully it will conceptualize what we just said about needing to be worried about the deviation when we generate it so that it doesn't get over-deviated. The question goes like this. What is the frequency deviation for a 12.210 megahertz reactance modulated oscillator? Um, that should be one... Uh, sorry about that, folks. Um, yeah, 12.210, that's correct. Me megahertz reactance modulated oscillator in a 5 kilohertz deviation, 14.520 megahertz phone transmitter. So let's break this question down a little bit. Let's see if we can make sense of what this question is telling us. 
Remember, we are talking about multipliers. So we want to end up with a transmitter transmitting on the frequency 146.520 megahertz. That is in the 2 meter VHF band. That's where we want to end up. But before multiplying, we are starting by generating a frequency of 12.210 megahertz. Remember we said we'd be generating a lower frequency. We are able to generate that. And then we need to multiply it. So the frequency that we start off generating is 12.210. When we generate that, we have to multiply it by 12. And when we do that, we will end up with 146.520. So that's the first calculation that we do here. If we want to end up with 146 decimal 520 and we have our first generated signal as 12.210, let us see what multiplier we need. And we simply divide 146520 by 12.210 and we get 12. So that is how we know if we're generating our signal at 12.210 in the radio and we want it to end up on a final signal as 146 decimal 520, the multiplier has to be a 12 multiplier. But notice, because it's a 12 multiplier, we have to go with 1 12th de deviation. So notice, we said that we want to end up with a 5 kilohertz deviation in the output. So we need to work backwards and figure out what deviation do we need to put in the input, knowing that the multiplier is 12. Whatever deviation we put in, it's going to multiply it by 12. So if we start with the end in mind, we begin with the end in mind, we end up, we want to end up with a five kilohertz deviation. That's what we need for our FM signal. And we need to have an input such that when it's multiplied by 12, we end up with five. So we do that calculation. We take one twelfth of five, which is one twelfth. Now that's five kilohertz. They give us the answer, they give us the question in kilohertz. We may remember that to go from kilohertz to hertz, we multiply by a thousand. So that's why we end up with 112 multiplied by 5,000 because it's 5,000 hertz, which is the equivalent of 5 kilohertz. When we take 112 to 5,000, we end up with 416 decimal 7. By the way, the book has an error in it. I think it says 416 decimal 7 kilohertz, and that is incorrect. So those of you all who might be following in the book, there's a little typo, I think it is, inside of there. So... This is exactly what we use the calculation for. We, because we're passing the signal that we generate through our, mul our multiplier to end up with the frequency we want to, notice that the deviation is also multiplied and we have to take that into account to reduce the deviation so that when it's multiplied by 12, we end up with the correct deviation and we don't end up with an over-deviated signal. So we now come to a discussion on bandwidth for FM signals. So bandwidth should not be a strange concept to us. We, on the right-hand side, this diagram should be familiar at the technician class. We looked at it to show the bandwidth that's occupied by different types of signals like CW, as well as these various voice or phone signals, single sideband, AM, FM, and so on. So we are talking now about bandwidth of FM signals. So we are saying that FM is often used in the VHF, and you may remember from our technician class that VHF is frequencies between 30 and 300 megahertz, as well as the UHF band, which again, you remember from the technician class, UHF means between 300 and 3000 megahertz, or 300 megahertz to 3 gigahertz. Notice that we will use FM on VHF and UHF but we do not use FM on HF. And again, from the technician class, you remember, you may remember that HF is between three and 30 megahertz. So we will use FM on VHF, we'll use it on UHF, but we will not use it on HF. Why? Because of the relatively high amount of bandwidth that an FM signal occupies. It's very high compared to the other types of signals. So high is good to say it's high, but how do we actually calculate how high it is and the actual value of the bandwidth? So on the right hand side here, we had said in our classes that you know an FM signal occupies somewhere around 5,000 to 15,000 hertz or five kilohertz to 15 kilohertz, right? So we will see in an actual calculation 
what it actually is. These are just ranges that are approximately, right? But we're going to do a calculation now uh, in a short while, the next slide. But let's look at the formula that we use to calculate the bandwidth. So we just have a diagram showing here, you know, this is what it is for an FM between 5,000 and 15,000. But if we have to calculate the bandwidth, what are the parameters? What are the values that we use? And here's our trusty bandwidth formula. Bandwidth is equal to 2 multiplied by these terms and brackets. So we have to add or we have to sum the terms and brackets, then multiply it by 2. But what are the terms and brackets? We have delta F, which is the deviation. And then we have FM, which is frequency, the modulating frequency. All right? So delta F, deviation, plus FM, which is modulating frequency. We have to add these two together and then multiply by two. So this is our bandwidth formula to calculate the bandwidth of an FM signal. And we'll do an example shortly. So here we go. The question is, what is the total bandwidth of an FM phone transmission having five kilohertz deviation and three kilohertz modulating frequency? So let's dissect this question, and this is an actual question in the question pool in the exam. Let's dissect it. They're asking us for the total bandwidth. In other words, what is the bandwidth of an FM phone transmission? Again, remember we said when in amateur radio we talk about phone, we mean voice. And good point indeed there, um, friends. Uh, FM is also used on the 10, 10 meter band. Thanks very much. Okay, so Dissecting this question, FM phone transmission simply means a voice transmission. We are speaking or speech. And they have given us the parameters. We're saying it's a 5 kilohertz deviation. So they're giving you what the deviation is. You don't have to guess it. And they're telling you that the modulating frequency is 3 kilohertz. So you're humming a, a 3 kilohertz tune, right? What is the total bandwidth of that transmission if you have these values? Well... We start off by using our trusty FM bandwidth formula, and we learned that bandwidth is equal to 2 multiplied by delta F, which is the deviation, and FM, which is the modulating frequency. Do they give us these terms? So we try to solve for bandwidth. Bandwidth equals something. Well, 2 is just a number, but we de do we have delta F? Well, yes, we do. Delta F is the deviation, and they have given us as 5, 5 kilohertz. And do we, have, do we have FM? Well, FM is modulating frequency. So they give us both values. 3 kilohertz is the modulating frequency. So we just plug those values into our trusty formula. So delta F is what? Deviation is 5 kilohertz, so we plug it in. So that's how we end up with 5 here. And FM which is this term, is 3 kilohertz, so we plug it into our formula. So we end up with bandwidth is equal to 2 multiplied by what is in brackets, which is 5 plus 3. So 5 plus 3 is 8. 8 multiplied by 2 is 16, so we end up with bandwidth is equal to 16 kilohertz. So the bandwidth of this FM phone transmission having these properties, 5 kilohertz deviation, 3 kilohertz modulating frequency, is 16 kilohertz. Not far from what is mentioned in our trusty diagram here. All right. So we had dealt with digital modes during the technician class, and we said that a digital mode, you could conceptualize it as a mode where you use a computer to generate tones that will be sent to your radio, and your radio sends that transmission on. So think of digital modes using a computer to connect to your radio. Think of it that way. But there is a mode called Pactor 3. We need to be aware of Pactor 3 for our exam. Um, Pactor 3 is another mode, just like we had discussed modes like FT8. We said FT8 was a digital mode. So we could think of Pactor 3 as another digital mode. So Pactor 3 being a digital mode, it's not a voice or phone mode, so we compare and contrast it. It is used on the HF bands for sending and receiving email, or as we say, data. So Pactor 3 can be used to send data 
over our radio transmissions. And a factor three signal, because it's going over the air, will occupy some amount of bandwidth. And we're saying here, for the purpose of your exams, that a factor three signal occupies a similar bandwidth, not the same or not the exact, a similar bandwidth as that as a single sideband or SSB signal. And we're saying the factor three actually occupies about 2300 hertz or 2.3 kilohertz at its maximum data rate. And here's a little diagram showing a factor three uh, signal. And we're seeing that it occupies approximately 2300 hertz or 2.3 kilohertz of bandwidth. And again, we just kept up this bandwidth graph here to show you that, you know, SSB signals could take up to about 3,000 hertz as well. So they told us for our theory, and this is an exam question in the question pool, they will ask you, what um, is the bandwidth of a factor 3 signal? And you need to know it's 2,300 hertz. And they will also qualify it and tell you it occupies that bandwidth at the maximum data rate of the factor 3 signal. So we now come to the concept of duty cycle. What is duty cycle? Well, some of us might have used a blender or maybe a cake mixer or maybe a hair dryer. And sometimes, you know, we buy it in the store, we come home, we use it for a couple hours and then find that, wait a minute, this thing burn out, it stopped working. And what we didn't realize is that we chose not to read the manual. And if had we read the manual, the manual might have told us something like, one minute on, three minutes off, or one minute on, five minutes off. That is the duty cycle of the hair dryer or the blender or the mixer. Those devices, while they manufacture them for us to use, they don't mean that you come and you turn your hair dryer on and you leave it on for six hours continuous. It was not meant for that duty cycle. Just a dryer here, you come up the shower and you want to dry your hair, you turn it on for a minute. You blow dry it and switch it off and that's it. If you want to dry it some more, come back a couple of minutes later and you blow it again. We need to be aware of the duty cycle of equipment. It's the same thing like a car. A car could probably do 200 kilometers per hour, but we do not start our car and then go extra board and drive 200 kilometers per hour for six hours. We don't do that. The vehicle is not meant to do that. It will, it will burst to 100 kilometers per hour, which is our speed limit in Trinidad and Tobago, wherever, whatever jurisdiction you are, whether up the Caribbean, the US, wherever you are, you have your speed limit. You will use that as your gauge. You don't drive at maximum. So same thing with radio equipment, with amateur radio, they are not necessarily meant to be used at 100% duty cycle. So let's note, digital modes exercise your amateur radio equipment very much they tend to have very much higher duty cycles than the other HF modes such as CW and SSB. And it could exceed your transmitter's average power rating. Again, that's an exam question. So if you use your radio, you might be talking on your radio on SSB, single sideband, and you're not unduly stretching out your radio because your voice is boosty and you are within your duty cycle of the average power rating. But from the time you connect a computer to your radio, and you're using a digital mode, that digital mode might drive that radio at 100% for much longer than your voice would. So your average power rating will be higher and therefore you might be stressing out your transmitter. On the right hand side, we give you an idea here visually what duty cycle is about. So it's on for 50, so 50% 50 duty cycle, it's on for half of the time, it's off, on again, off, on again, off. So notice equally, it's as much on as it is off, and we say that's a signal with a 50% duty cycle. This is a 10% duty cycle on the right-hand side here. It's on for 10%, 90% of the time it's off. It's on for 10%, it's 90% off, and so on. And you have a 30% and a 70%, just to show you that the higher the duty cycle, the more transmission take place, and that might stress out your equipment or your radio. So we say here that most transmitters used in amateur radio are not designed to be operated at 100% duty cycle. It might shock you to learn that, but it was not meant to be. So you, as a ham, you have to be responsible and take good care of your equipment. Don't abuse it. Don't drive it to 100% duty cycle when it was not meant to. 
maybe commercial gear is, but not amateur, a lot of amateur radio equipment. For example, your equipment may have a transmitter output power of 100 watts. Many transmitters, HF transceivers can do 100 watts. But they did not mean for you to transmit continuously or for an extended period of time. It wasn't meant to be. You don't key down the 100 watts and let it run for six hours. No, you might blow your final uh, transistors, your output transistors. So we need to be as, as careful as possible as hams. And we need to be aware of the concept of duty cycle. And we need to be aware that digital modes can push the envelope in terms of the duty cycle for your radio. So you might want to back the power down a little bit. Don't run 100 watts. Maybe run it at, you know, 25 watts, 50 watts. Just bear in mind duty cycle. So we need to discuss, as we are talking digital modes, we need to be aware of the concept of symbol rate as well as bandwidth. Remember we said our last class, sometimes you have a signal and it can carry one value or one bit, but you can also have a signal that will carry more than one value. So in this example here, we have a signal that carries two values here, two zero, zero, zero. And then we have a transition to another signal and we say this signal carries two values, one, one. And then another signal level says zero, one, another signal level, one, zero. So what we are saying here is that a signal, while it's one signal, can actually carry more than one bit of information at a time. So we need to know what the symbol rate is for the particular digital mode that we're using. Some persons who might be familiar back in the day with modems, you might hear about board rate. Well, board rate and symbol rate means the same thing. In amateur radio, we talk about symbol rate. We do talk about board rate, but quite often or most often you hear symbol rate. But if you're familiar with the concept of a board rate as applied to the modems from yesteryear and so on, it's the same thing that we're talking about. But the idea about a symbol rate is that while you might have one symbol, one symbol might have more than one bits of information that it's carried with it. So just because you have one symbol being seen, that doesn't mean that it's one value alone that you can carry. You can carry multiple values even with one symbol. So you could have a symbol rate that is different to your data rate. And we need to know as hams that the higher the symbol rate you use, you are going to use a higher bandwidth. So it's not limitless. You could say, well, here what? I want to go with a higher symbol rate to send more information. Just be aware, be aware as a ham when you are using a higher symbol rate, you're configuring uh, your radio, your computer to use a higher symbol rate. You're going to be using more bandwidth. And if you use too much, you might actually exceed the allowable bandwidth for your mode and you might cause interference with an adjacent user. So you need to be aware of your symbol rate and know that if you use a higher symbol rate, you're going to be using higher bandwidth. And this is an exam question in the question pool. So our last slide uh, for this evening will be the concept of noise. Now, most of us are probably aware of noise. You know, you're trying to sleep, you're hearing noise. Uh, you're trying to have a phone conversation, there's someone with a television on and it's loud. You have your neighbor that's playing loud music and you're trying to have a nice, quiet conversation. That's noise to you. It's unwanted. Noise is anything that is unwanted to you. So when we are talking amateur radio, for digital modes, noise can be a real problem. Because when there's noise in our signal, we can have errors. So imagine you are looking at the other end of a transmission. Franz is sending me a transmission from St. Lucia to Trinidad and Tobago. And there's a lot of noise. And he says, hello. And if my signal does not have error correcting, I might see H-E-L-L. -L. And I will say, but wait a minute, why is Franz sending me such a message, hell? But he really meant, really meant to say hello. But because of the noise, I didn't get the last O. So noise is not a good thing. As we say here, when you're operating digital modes, the presence of noise can cause errors. On the receiving end, it may render the message unintelligible. Franz sent me hello, but I got hell. Dear, dear. 
Some digital modes can and does include error correction, but many of them do not. If it includes error correction, well, all right, it will send again and request again and send again, and you'll get the correct message in the end. But many do not have that, so you'll get at the mercy of the noise what you get. So you can use filters to remove the noise. And how filters work, they adjust the receiver's bandwidth so that only the signal of interest is permitted and the rest is rejected. Why do you want to listen to the signal that is unwanted? On the right-hand side here, we have a filter notching. You have, let's say on this right-hand side here, you have some noise, you know, a lot of noise. But I, I don't want to listen to that noise, so I'm not using this wide filter here that will pick up the noise. I use a narrower filter. Why? Because this is the signal I'm interested in here. This, uh, I'm not interested in this bit of noise. This is unwanted. If I use a wide filter, I will pick up this noise and that might cause my message to be garbled. So I use my filter, notch it low, uh, narrower, and guess what? I am only looking at my signal, intended signal. I'm not looking at my unwanted signal over here. It's excluded. So because I use a filter, a narrow enough filter, a proper filter for the mode that I'm using, the bandwidth of my signal, I use a filter to just keep that signal in check. I exclude anything outside of it so it does not interfere. And we say that when filters are used properly, the receiver bandwidth becomes matched to the bandwidth of the mode being used and results in the best signal to noise ratio. So this is an exam question. So we need to be aware of that. When we use filters, that's exactly what it does. And uh, in addition to using filters for digital mode, don't think we, can, we don't use digital, uh, filters for other modes such as CW and SSB. So the point that you know Franz made, we do make some uh, statements here, but you know, take it with a grain of salt. Filters are also used for other modes. It's not uh, exclusive to digital modes, but we are talking digital modes and we are on a topic of digital modes and those are the exam questions. But just for your information, know that filters are also used for CW and SSB2 remove noise. It cleans up the signal a lot and you hear things a lot better. So folks, that is it for the theory. Again, um, we invite you to check us out on Zello if you're interested, persons who are not yet licensed hams and you want to get into doing some, what looks like radio transmissions, it's voice over IP, there's this app called Zello, you can start using and you know get into the radio operations as React, we operate this channel and we try to go with standard radio operating practices, even though it's technically not radio, it's voice over IP using the internet, push it to our app, but it can be good practice for you. So you're welcome to join these channels. Certainly, I just thank everyone. And remember, especially for the new students, we keep getting new students every week. And we encourage you to check out the technician level classes. That's all online as on demand at this link, tech.ttreact.com. You have 16 sessions. Um, someone did tell me last week that they were not getting SMS text messages. And it is probably because when you registered, there might have been a typo in the phone number that was listed. So if you are not getting SMS messages once a week, please send me an email with your phone number so we can correct it on the database. Uh, so folks, um, I did indicate last class that we have an upcoming session. We're doing amateur radio classes here, a lot of theoretical concepts for the exams, but we're going to have a session on Wednesday the 23rd. You are welcome to join. We will send an email out to persons. You can save the date Wednesday 23rd of June. That's this coming Wednesday at 8 p.m. We'll be having a little session on radio operation tips. Uh, that is optional for you, uh, but you are welcome to join this session um, on Wednesday. We have Labor Day in Trinidad and Tobago on Saturday. Certainly happy Labor Day. And we also, of course, have Father's Day on Sunday. And we say happy Father's Day. So our next session is expected to be on Friday, the 25th of June at 8.30 p.m. And we say during uh, our curfew hours, please observe. Uh, we want you back here next week, Friday. So folks, please take every precaution. Be safe. And all the best. Do have a good night. Thank you very much. Okay, Larry. Thanks very much. Uh, check your email. Um, 
the information is in the email. So, Larry, uh, it was in the invitation to this session. Just take a look. The link is at the bottom. You too. Happy Father's Day. No problem. Thanks a lot, Franz. Really appreciate your encouragement and the advice. Adesh, all the best. You too. Enjoy the holiday. Have a good one on Sunday. Sylvester, good night as well. Okay, George, you too. Sleep well. Ramzan, good night. All the best. Yes, indeed. Okay, thanks, friends. Uh, okay, Anthony, got your message. All right. Uh, Bunik, um, all the best. Okay, Avin, good night as well. Roger, good night. Okay, Jessica, good night. Adish, all the best to you. Natasha, good night as well. Okay, Gary, good night as well. You take good care too. Okay, no problem, Larry. Uh, let me know if you don't get it. Just let me know. But uh, the email does contain the information on your question. Okay, Jermaine. Yes, I did see your email and I'm looking to get the contact information for you. So I'm hoping to get a response as soon as possible to that question there, Jermaine. As soon as uh, we get the contact information of those persons, we will uh, pass it on. Okay, Kevin, you too. Have a good night. Happy Father's Day. All the best. Okay, Roger, take good care. Anthony, certainly welcome. And happy Father's Day. Paula, do have a good night as well. Take good care. Okay, Ron, great. Glad to know that no internet issues tonight. Glad you were able to join and it, it held. Very, great to have you as usual. Roger, take good care. Have a good night. Not a problem, Jermaine. All the best. Okay, Victor, you too. Have a good night. All the best. I did see your question as well. And I will endeavor to respond in the soonest. 